Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. In this episode, I interview someone whose work uh, I, I really like. Uh, his name is Chip Conley. I read he's he's written several books, but I read one of his books called Peak, and that's kind of you know that's the book that turned me on to him. And uh, the book talks about some some research that was done by by a guy named Abraham Maslow. Uh, I think it was done primarily in the fifties and sixties. Uh, Maslow is a psychologist looking in, and what he's best known for is something called the hierarchy of needs, which is kind of his outline of the of the of the core needs uh, that that people have, ranging from basic survival stuff to all, you know, at the bottom of this pyramid to transformational self-actualization type stuff at the top. And, um, that I've always kind of found that, that research interesting. So, uh, that, that's what turned me on to Chip's book because Chip's book is about how he has applied that, uh, construct, uh, or in that research to his business and, uh, his business which, which actually he sold, uh, now, but, but he, he had a, a hospitality group, a hotel company, which he started when he was 26 and he built it up over the course of, uh, I think 24 years. And now, now he's involved in their Airbnb and he does a lot of speaking, you know, he's featured on Ted and he writes books and he consults, he does all kinds of things. A uh, very interesting guy. And I wanted to get Chip on the podcast because, uh, I know that a lot of you are either entrepreneurs or are people that are all striving not just to get a fit body, but you want to, you know, get ahead in other areas of your life. And I thought that uh, Chip's, just his viewpoints and, and his philosophies uh, for, for living and for working and for, for the workplace as well, building organization, building team, uh, I, I thought that you, you could benefit from him because I, I have really liked what he has had to say. So let's get to the interview. All right. So, hey, Chip, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. I'm a fan. It's great to be with you. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I found you through your book, Peak, which I had read a few months ago um, and really, really liked and recommended to, to the guys that work with me. And I've recommended it to, uh, you know, on the podcast, actually on my website and stuff. And I liked a lot of what you had to say in that book and just your overall philosophy and kind of, you know, you get a sense of who you are. And um, I thought it's pretty cool. So that's that's why I thought it'd be fun to have you on the podcast. Thank you. You are a peaker. You are a peaker. <laughs> I try. I try. Um, all right. So let's just kind of start with the title. So, and then which kind of brings you to that point of peaker. Like what, why that word? What, what are you referring to exactly? So, um, yeah, the story behind it is that there's a guy named Abraham Maslow uh, who wrote a, a series of books as a psychologist in the 40s and 50s here in the U.S. And uh, his books were some of the first books that the idea of people having a peak experience in their life and how positive psychology could actually uh, enrich people uh, psychologically. Most psychologists prior to that point were more focused on the bad things in people as opposed to the good things in people. Right, right. And so peak uh, refers to the idea that you can create peak experiences in your life. And the book is really about how to do that organizationally, not just for yourself, but actually how can you use Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the famous pyramid, and do that for an organization. Cool. And so what is a peak experience? Peak experience as an individual tends to be something that's memorable, is timeless, and it's when you're in a flow where you actually feel like something's coming through you, that you're channeling, that you're just an amazing channel for some passion or skill that, um, that you're providing. For an organization, it's when a group of people are in that flow zone. I like to think of it um, from an athletic perspective as crew. When you have a crew that's in unison rowing all together, um, this phenomena happens that doesn't make sense in physics, but actually as everybody's rowing, the boat actually starts to lift out of the water, and they call that swing. Mm. And when a crew is in that swing state, swinging state, um, it really means that they are so together that they actually are able to, to basically lift up above the friction. That it happens in rowing, it's water. In life, it's the problems we have in an organization. And you lift out of that. And that's what a, a, a peak crew can or, or organization can do. That's awesome. I like that metaphor a lot. So let's talk a bit about, about uh, Maslow's hierarchy. Can you just break down, you know, what's the kind of basic theory of this construct? You have the, the, the different yeah. levels of it? Yeah, so uh, he's known for the five-level pyramid. He did actually have a seven- and eight-level pyramid later in his life, but we'll just focus on the five levels. The basic premise is this. Uh, in life, as a human, 
you have some basics that you, ha- you need, food, water, sleep, air, your physiological needs. If you actually are being deprived of any of those four for any period of time, any extended period of time, nothing else really matters. But once you get those basic needs met, you sort of, and not fully, but maybe 50 to 70% met, you go to the next level. The next level is safety. And then once that's met, you go to the next level, which is esteem. And then the fourth level is, I'm sorry, third level is social belonging needs. Fourth level is esteem. And the fifth level is self-actualization. Self-actualization was really defined by the U.S. Army but as be all you can be. Yeah. Now, Maslow yeah. defined it that before the U.S. Army created an ad campaign around that. But that's the, the most succinct way for me to describe self-actualization. So that's really what um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs was about. The problem is that, I mean, it was great and it was very much individual focused. But Maslow died at age 62, just as he was starting to look at the, how do you take Maslow's hierarchy of needs for an individual and apply, apply it to a collective like an organization, for nonprofit, whatever, and that, or t- a team. And that's really what I did is I took his work and I took it to the organizational side. Awesome. Yeah. So let's get into that. So uh, in your book, you kind of give three levels of, of need here. And this is, this is with employees, your own team, right? So you have money, recognition, and meaning. Can you explain a bit more about these and kind of how do you go about fulfilling these for your employees or helping them fulfill their needs? Sure. So you have a five-level pyramid. I, I, one of the things, one of the sort of paradigms I tried to create here was the idea that there's really three basic themes in life. There's survival, there's succeed, and then there's transform. And so uh, with the, the survival being physiological and safety needs, succeed being social belonging and esteem. And think about it. When you feel successful in life, it usually relates to you feel connected. Recog- recognized. Or- you feel belong, like you belong, you feel recognized, and you feel that esteem from it. And then at the top of the pyramid, transformation uh, is, is the state of, for self-actualization. So survival, succeed, transform. Applying that to work, it's like a job, a career, or a calling. Mm-hmm. And a job is when you're exclusively focused on the tasks and the money. And so money's at the base of the, um, the employee pyramid. When I say money, I mean the full comp package, not just your salary. Now, most leaders think that that's the only thing or the primary thing that uh, employees care about. And the truth is it's the fourth li- most likely reason a person leaves their job. Uh, money is not the primary person, uh, reason a person leaves their job. The primary reason a person leaves their job in the United States is because of their boss. And so the second level of, of the employee pyramid is recognition. So money and then recognition. And so what it means basically is as a boss or a leader, it means you actually need to understand what it is that would actually recognize, be it be um, a recognition for this person working for you or for these group of people. And everybody has different needs for recognition. For some, it's public. For others, it's private. Some, are, some have particular goals that they actually want to hit. And they want you as their boss to be totally there for them, coaching them. And like when they hit it, they want you to say, yes, you hit it. Others actually, frankly, want the recognition to happen sporadically. They're not expecting it. So part of it is actually being smart enough psychologically about what's going to be um, a, a recognition that people prefer, uh, appreciate. And then the top level of that pyramid uh, for the employee is meaning. So money, recognition, meaning. And there's really two sides to meaning. There's meaning in work and meaning at work. Meaning in work means the work that you're doing on a daily basis. You love what you're doing. You would do it anywhere. It doesn't matter the company you're working for. It actually just matters that you're doing this kind of work. Mm. Meaning at work is I really appreciate the noble purpose of this organization and the mission of the organization. And by just being in that organization, I feel like I'm doing great work. I may be actually collecting paper clips, um, which I don't like. So the meaning in work for, for that person would be really low. The meaning at work would be, would be what, what is lighting them up. Ideally, you get both. Right. Great companies get meaning in work and meaning at work, right? And if you do that well, you'll have people living their calling. And in your experience, just building your businesses and doing everything you've done, how do you help people find meaning in work? Because that's such a thing out there, you know, that the stereotypical attitude that work sucks and, oh, you, you just grind it out and you do it, you, you know, life is about everything you do outside of work. It's a really good question. Um, the, the truth is most companies are full of people with just jobs yeah. and not with callings. So um, just to give some context, I, I started my own company when I was 26, grew at uh, a company called Joie de Vivre Hotels, um, 
grew it for 24 years as the CEO, uh, became the second largest boutique hotelier in the U.S., uh, based in San Francisco, sold it, uh, and then now have been helping to lead Airbnb for the last two and a half years as the head of global hospitality and strategy, but really mentoring. I didn't even know that. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm basically helping and mentoring the three founders and helping the company become you know, the, the world's best hospitality company. Um, so what I can say in both of these contexts is that uh, understanding, uh, first on your own, for your own side of what actually gives you that sense of meaning in work, it's usually when you're having a peak experience, mm-hmm. meaning you lose track of time you absolutely get so engrossed in what you're doing that you actually, it, what you're doing and who you are are completely the same thing. Mm-hmm. Who, what you're doing and who you're, and who you're being sort of feel like they are fused together. It's, it's something that actually, once you finish doing it, you don't usually feel tired. You just feel energized. Yep, so yep. a job depletes you and a calling energizes you. In the context of being a leader, some of that trying to figure out, okay, if I want only people who are living their calling, so much of it goes back to who are we hiring? You want to hire people who are well-suited. At a hotel, on the front desk of a hotel, we call our front desk clerks hosts. At a host of a hotel, you want someone who's not um, an introvert. You can have an introvert, but it just an introvert at the front desk of a hotel is going to get worn out pretty quickly right, because right. They, get, they will get depleted by the amount of people interaction going on. It doesn't mean you yeah, can't. Like I probably wouldn't something. do very good. At that. There's a point where I just wouldn't want to talk anymore. That's right. Exactly. And so you have to helping people see what's right for them. And you having a good sense of that is a really critical part of being a great leader and a great creating a team that actually can have a sense of the qualities of what will make a, a person successful in a particular job. Mm. And so that's just tailing your hiring process and over the years learning what kind of personality traits and right. It, it reminds me of um, you might even know him. I, I read Danny Meyer's book, Setting the Table, recently, and you know, very well, yeah, yeah. So his his whole thing of looking for people that want to create pleasurable experiences that really get personal pleasure from just giving someone else a joyful or pleasurable type of experience. He found those were the best people to work in his restaurants. Yep, exactly. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, okay, awesome. So that's that's kind of the employee thing. Let's now talk about the needs of customers. So in your book, then you talk about. Um, kind of the, the risk of getting comfortable with just satisfying customers, which would be that bottom, you know, just giving people what they expect to pay for. It's a thing. It does whatever it's supposed to do rather than delighting the hell out of them. So kind of how does that work and what are some examples about how you've gone about doing that? Or Yep. So you take this the three-level pyramid, what I call the transformation pyramid of survival, succeed, transform. Now you go, from, we're applying it to the employee. Now let's apply it to the customer. The customer would be the, the survival need is meet my expectations. Now think about that for a moment. Think about you being a customer. No matter what kind of customer you are, the baseline of what actually creates satisfaction is having your expectations met. There's a great uh, equation I love. Disappointment equals expectations minus reality. Right, right. That's very appropriate to sort of say, okay, so what's the expectation of our core customer and are we delivering on it? But that that, that only creates satisfaction. And satisfaction in the world we live in today does not necessarily create loyalty or Mm -hmm. commitment. So the next level, the, the success level for a customer is when they actually have their desires met. So a desire, as a hotelier, um, I would just say an expectation for a customer usually is a physical thing. My room is clean. Uh, it's not too noisy. The, the bed is comfortable so I can sleep in it, et cetera. Doesn't smell like cigarettes. Doesn't smell like cigarettes. Yeah. I mean, again, the more you pay, the higher your expectations true, go. True, true. Um, Next, the next level, like desires, could still have physical components. So they gave me a room that was bigger than I expected. I got a suite. Well, getting a suite might make you feel like your esteem needs are met. So what tends to happen on the desires level, a lot of times it's, it sort of moves from the physical assets of the, what you got to a little bit of the social belonging and esteem parts. So like, oh, wow, the general manager of the hotel wrote, it, wrote a, a note to me. And said, we've upgraded you to a suite with a view. Ah, okay, I guess I'm a special person. The front desk staff remembered my name because I was here three weeks ago. And, and before I even like, got to the front desk, they said, hey, hey, Mr. Connolly, great to see you. Um, so the desire level is not exclusively related to social belonging and esteem needs, but it is the start of how you're differentiating yourself mm. as a product. So your product at the baseline, the survival level, is you're pretty much commoditized. Now you move up to this level. Desires are the way you're starting to differentiate yourself. The way a company 
goes way beyond differentiation, though, is to that get to that third level, the transformation. So going to the third level of the customer pyramid is the unrecognized needs level, and it's the transformation. And you, if you do this well, you create customers who are evangelists. And like Apple did it well. Apple took the idea of the Sony Walkman and said, why don't we create a, an iPod? And, you know, Sony should have done that. But, you know, the truth is once you become sort of a, you have a, a certain approach to doing a business, you don't necessarily want to disrupt yourselves. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't Hilton or Hyatt or Marriott that created the Airbnb. It was these three guys in their mid-20s who did it. So um, the key here is to understand what are the things that a customer wants that they actually never thought anybody could deliver for them. And once you deliver that and then consistently do that and actually get better, you actually get to a place where you're creating evangelists because nobody else is providing that. So as you move up the pyramid, you create more and more differentiation and uh, much, much more commitment and loyalty from the customer. And what are some examples of how you've done that? You know, in Yeah. In well, let me give you an example. So each time we created a hotel at, at Joie de Vivre, we created 52 boutique hotels, we imagined a magazine and five adjectives to define the hotel. Now, the reason we did this was because it helped us to understand the psychology of the customer. So let me use an example. We have a hotel in San Francisco called the Vitali, Hotel Vitali. Um, it's a really great luxury hotel on the waterfront on the bay. Uh, in creating that hotel, we came up actually with two magazines that define the hotel, a uh, real simple magazine and dwell magazine. And the five adjectives that define those two magazines together were modern, urbane, fresh, natural, and nurturing. In creating this hotel 15 years ago, um, I decided if, if we're going to have a modern, urbane, fresh, natural, nurturing hotel that's going to deliver that experience for its guests, we are going to probably attract guests who would use those five adjectives to describe themselves. Mm. That's why I say boutique hotels are really like a mirror or an identity refreshment for a guest. You stay in the hotel and it feels like the hotel's personality rubs off on you. Well, in the case of this hotel, the Hotel Vitali, it meant that on the top floor of the hotel when we launched and for the first 10 years it was open, we actually had a yoga studio on the top floor and 400 square feet uh, of the top floor. Now, nobody, it never made sense in a financial district <laughs> in the market to have a yoga studio in the penthouse. Yeah. didn't make any sense at all. But I knew that this is something that was uh, a growing desire of people is to figure out how when they're traveling as business travelers – they can still feel connected to their body and connected to actually tranquility and relaxation. Um, and so we decided to do this. My investors thought I was crazy. I was taking the best real estate in the building and turning it into a yoga studio. But it turned out to be the best marketing thing we'd ever done because the Wall Street Journal and LA Times and uh, New York Times all wrote stories about it because there's this cool hotel, business hotel, luxury hotel that actually has a, a free yoga class every morning. Um, so it was really a great way to position the hotel. Yeah, that's a great example. I mean, I, I can relate to that even in, I have a, a business that sells workout supplements. And one of the things that set us apart is we spend a lot more money on our products than, than a lot of our competitors because the, in the retail world, you know, where if, if, if a supplement costs $5, that's going to be 40 to $50 in GNC. The problem is you can't make good supplements for $5. You just can't. So you make crap and then you just, you know, use marketing spin to sell it. So a yeah, similar thing in the beginning where I was like, well, why don't you just, why don't we just spend three times, four times as much on these products and sell them direct to consumer and forget the retail retail doesn't work. And so it was just in a similar way where it was, but that's become now, and that's something now we're known for that people know, and you can go look at the form people that are informed, look at the formulations and they go, uh, sure. you know, they love it for that. But from a business standpoint in the beginning, I had people telling me that'll never work. You, you know, yeah. Okay. The margins will be fine direct consumer, but if you don't have retail, you're just, you're just never going to take off, blah, blah, blah. Congratulations. <laughs> um, so in your book, you also say, you know, you talk about, well, first let me back up. So, you know, out, just out, I guess, out and about talking to people, a lot of people kind of associate capitalism kind of with, with greed. Uh, and in your book, you talk about the power that business has to create long-term good in the world. And that's something I really liked about just you and your message. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, let's let's use Airbnb for a moment as an example. So Airbnb is a, on the path to being the most valuable hospitality company in the world. Uh, surpassed Marriott, about to surpass Hilton. 
Uh, and that's for a company that's ba- barely seven years old and really has only been growing to the kind of size we are now for the last four years. So why is that? Well, there's a basic mission and mantra to the company that we sort of summarized about a year ago uh, in an ad campaign that we're now running, which is called Belong Anywhere. The whole premise of Airbnb in terms of what we want to do is not to just be the biggest hospitality company in the world. We want to actually turn strangers into friends all over the world by allowing people to open their home so that we can stay with stay with them in an extra bedroom or maybe even take their whole place if they're if they're traveling themselves. Now, you know, there's controversy attached to this uh, on, on many levels. That's not the purpose of why I'm bringing it up. It's maybe to say instead that the fact that we actually had a mission that was saying we want people to feel like they can belong anywhere in the world. We're in 34,000 cities, 191 countries. No hotel company could ever say that. They're just not. So we are able to, basic, based upon a, an initial premise that we want people to feel like they can go stay anywhere in the world and live like a local, get to know the locals, be able to have more space for less money, um, but most importantly, have a sense of belonging anywhere. That, that basic theme helped us to grow to what we are. Joie de vivre, the theme was in the name of the company. Joie de vivre means joy of life. It's the French phrase, just going out and experiencing the joy of life. Rather than calling ourselves the ABC Hotel Company or naming it after me, Hilton, Marriott, I think at the core of most companies is a noble purpose. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, I think it's just kind of, I feel like we're coming out of the industrial age type of mentality of where people were just cogs in a machine and you know where you had guys like Carnegie literally working his workers to death so he could make another you know whatever he was in today's dollars he was worth 400 billion dollars like what more do you want why are your people dying in your factories when you're worth 400 billion dollars doesn't even make sense yeah. and from that came you know management whatever so I, I think I and I, I like that a lot um, all right, last question because I know you, you know your time. You got to go. Uh, so, what are three books? Maybe it could be on work or business or success that you think everyone listening right now should read besides your book, of course, which is obvious. Well, I, you know, Tony Shea is a great friend of mine, and he's written the foreword for my last two books. Uh, my last book was called Emotional Equations. So, Tony wrote a book called Delivering Happiness. Um, you know, Tony's Tony was basically grew Zappos into the company it is, but he's also had other. Uh, financial successes as an entrepreneur. So I, I think that's a great book just in terms of how, understanding how do you actually use happiness and creating happiness as a, um, a competitive advantage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, big fan of that book. You know, there's a book called Man's Search for Meaning. This is not a business book, but it's a business book that I think is very relevant. It's a, it's a, a book about meaning that's relevant to leadership. Uh, it's about Viktor Frankl, who was in a concentration camp in World War II. And in, in being in the concentration camp, he had this epiphany uh, and it's really having a sense of meaning. And that is really in many ways how I got to that pyramid of money recognition meaning. So that'd be a second book. I think that, that you know, it's a, it's a tough read. The first half is basically his story of what it was like to be in a concentration camp. And it's a psychological book as well. So if you don't like abstract psychology, not great, but if you do, it's an incredibly compelling uh, read. Yeah. I've read both. Uh, I like them both a lot. Tribal leadership, uh, uh, you know, a third book uh, I'd say is really speaks to the idea of teams. But actually, even another one I'll, I'll say is uh, the Five Dysfunctions of Teams uh, mm. by Pat Lencioni. We've used that very uh, much here at Airbnb in terms of trying to understand how do you build teams that are doing that thing that I ter- called earlier swing uh, out there on the water. Awesome, that's great. No, I, I have read. I haven't read the last two, but uh, they're actually on my list of my never-ending list. <laughs> okay, well, great. This was uh, this was awesome, Chip. I, as I said, as I said, I'm a big fan of yours, and I really appreciate you taking the time to to do this. And um, I know that everyone's going to like it because whenever you know get talk about stuff like this, I get asked for more. So that's what that was why this came up. Well, I appreciate you uh, being a peaker, Mike. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, okay. see you later. Okay, bye.